ever held a gemstone and just wondered, you know, what's really inside? Oh, absolutely. Those little flashes, the tiny structures. It's like a whole secret world in there that you can barely see it. Right. And like any explorer needs their gear. Uh, uncovering those secrets, it takes the right tools. Definitely. Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're uh, exploring the essential gemology tools based on this really great guide we found. Yeah, think of this as like your shortcut, your fast track to understanding the science behind it all. What? It's pretty captivating stuff. Whether you're just admiring jewelry or you're really into the uh, technical side of identifying gems. Knowing these tools, what they do, it's absolutely key. We just wanna give you a clear, you know, straightforward look at them and why they matter. And we know you're coming at this from all different angles, maybe researching a purchase, maybe you're a collector, or maybe just fascinated by shiny things. Totally fine, all welcome. We're gonna uh, break it down simply. No need to worry about getting you know, bogged down in jargon. Okay, great. So let's kick things off with the real basics. The absolute must-haves for looking closer at gems. And right at the top of that list, the jeweler's loop. Ah, the loop. That's the classic image, isn't it? The little magnifying glass. It is, but it's, well, it's a bit more sophisticated than just any old magnifier. Right. So what's its main job? Its primary use is really for a close-up look, inside and on the surface, things you just wouldn't see otherwise. Like what specifically? We're talking inclusions, those little natural bits inside the stone, mm. uh, surface marks too, and checking the quality of the cut. Wow. Like a pocket microscope almost. Exactly. That's a good way to put it. So if you're thinking of getting one, what should you look for? There must be loads of different magnifiers out there. There are, but the guide, and it's quite specific on this, really emphasizes getting a triplet lens with 10x magnification. Okay, a triplet lens, 10x. Why those specs? Well, the triplet part means it has three lenses combined. Yeah. It's designed to correct for distortion, you know, so the image doesn't look warped. And also for um, color fringing, chromatic aberration, technically. Oh, yeah. So you get a true view. Precisely. Yeah. And the 10x magnification, that's the industry standard for grading gems. So it gives everyone a consistent benchmark. That makes a lot of sense. Consistency is important, right? So everyone's seeing the same thing. Exactly. It means if someone notes a feature under 10x somewhere, someone else should see it the same way elsewhere. It creates a common language for quality. Okay. Useful. Any tips for actually using it? Seems like it might be fiddly. It can be at first, yeah. There's a bit of a technique. Uh, steady hands are key. Resting your hands on a table helps. Right. And the trick is bring the stone close to your eye, then bring the loop up between your eye and the stone until it focuses. Ah, uh, okay. Stone first, then loop, not the other way around. <laughs> exactly. And oh, always, always make sure the loop and the stone are clean. Even a tiny bit of dust can hide something or look like something it isn't. Good practical advice. Hmm. Okay, so from the superpower eye tool, let's talk hands, uh, tweezers, and stone holders. Seems basic, but why not fingers? Well, imagine trying to pick up, say, a single grain of sugar and look at it really closely. Tricky. Very. Our fingers are just too big, too clumsy for tiny gems. The guide actually compared it to trying to write with spaghetti. Huh. Okay, I get the picture. So special tweezers then? Yep. Gemological tweezers, they're usually anti-magnetic, which is important, so they don't interfere with certain tests or pick up metal bits. Okay. And they have a textured grip, serrated usually, helps hold on tight, and often grooved tips, especially good for holding onto round stones. Right. Stops them pinging away, yeah. all about precision and uh, not damaging the gems. And stone holders, what are they exactly? They're basically little clamps or grips designed to hold the gemstone securely in one position. Ah, so you don't have to keep fiddling with the tweezers. Exactly. Oh, Super is... useful when you're under magnification or doing tests. It stops you constantly readjusting, lowers the risk of dropping it. Makes sense. Plus, it keeps your fingers off the stone itself. No smudges. Yeah, you don't want greasy fingerprints messing up your view, especially if you're looking for tiny details. Or messing up tests. This combo, tweezers and holders, it really underlines how crucial careful handling is. Definitely. And speaking of clean views, the guide really stresses cleaning before you test. It's not just for looks, is it? Oh, absolutely not. It's vital for accuracy, especially with optical tests. How so? Well, any dirt, grease, even just a thin film on the surface, it can change how light passes through or reflects off the gem. And that could mess up your readings. Totally. It could lead you to the wrong conclusion entirely with some of the instruments we'll talk about later. Okay, so cleaning is step one. What's usually in a gemologist's cleaning kit? You typically find um, soft brushes, maybe an ultrasonic cleaner, though careful with that, 
Only for durable stones. Right. Not for everything. No. Lint-free cloths are essential for polishing without scratching. And maybe some alcohol wipes for stubborn stuff. And keeping the tools clean, too, I guess. Just as important, dirty tools mean inaccurate results. Makes sense. Then there's storage. Often <laughs> overlooked, maybe. But it's more than chucking things in a drawer. Oh, much more. Proper storage protects the gems and the tools. The guide mentions things like padded gem boxes, you know, individual compartments. Yeah. Anti-tarnish bags for some gems or silver settings. Labeled compartments so you know what's what. It sounds like organization is key. It really is. It shows you're serious, prevents damage, keeps tools good, makes everything easier to find. It distinguishes, you know, the amateur from the pro. Good point. It's about protecting your investment, really, mm -hmm. in the stones and the tools. Okay, so that's the basic kit covered. Now the guide moves into advanced gemological instruments. Sounds like things get serious here. Yeah, this is where the analytical power really ramps up. Mm -hmm. These tools let us dig into a gem's fundamental properties by seeing how it uh, interacts with light. Okay, like what? Well, the guide lists several key ones. There's the refractometer. Refractometer, what's that do? It measures the refractive index, basically how much light bends when it enters the stone. It's like a like a fingerprint for many gems. Ah, unique bending properties. Yeah. Okay, what else? Then there's the polariscope. That helps figure out if light travels through the gem in one direction or splits into two. Single or double refraction. Another key identifier. Very important one, yes. Then the spectroscope. This one analyzes the light that the gem absorbs. What does that tell you? It can reveal clues about its chemical makeup, what elements are causing its color. Really fascinating. Wow, okay. And one more mentioned is the dichroscope. Simpler tool, this one. It shows if a doubly refractive gem shows different colors from different right. angles. Oh, like those stones that seem to shift color slightly when you turn them. Exactly. That property is called pleochroism. The dichroscope makes it easy to see if a gem has it. Pretty neat. That is cool. Quite a lineup of specialized gear. It's good to know what's possible for deeper analysis. Yeah. Okay, next the guide talks about tools for measuring physical properties. So moving away from light, more towards tangible stuff. Exactly. Quantifying physical characteristics, the guide highlights the Mohs Hardness Kit. Ah, the scratch test. I've heard of that. Yep. It's a set of minerals, each with a known hardness. You carefully try to scratch the unknown gem with them, or see what scratches it, to figure out its hardness on the Mohs scale. So diamond is 10, the hardest. Right. Only a diamond scratches a diamond. Quartz is 7, it can scratch glass, which is around 5.5. Knowing the hardness helps identify it and tells you how durable it might be. Useful for jewelry choices. <laughs> Very useful. Yeah. The guide also mentions specific gravity testing using special liquids or uh, precision balances. Specific gravity, that's density, right? Essentially, yes. How dense the gem is compared to water. Another unique property that helps pin down what it is. Amazing how these sort of simple sounding tests give really valuable clues. Yeah, scratching stones and weighing them. Yeah. Surprisingly scientific. Okay, now, light-based testing tools. We touched on light with the advanced stuff, but this sounds more direct. Yeah, these tools use light in specific ways to reveal certain reactions or features, right. like the UV light lamp. Ultraviolet light, what does that show? Well, some gems glow under UV light. It's called fluorescence. Yeah. Or sometimes they keep glowing after the light is off phosphorescence. And that helps identify them. The color and intensity of the glow can be very characteristic for certain gems or indicate treatments sometimes. Interesting. What else uses light? There's fiber optic light, basically a very bright focused beam you can direct precisely. Good for examining specific spots. Okay. And dark field illumination. This is clever. You light the stone from the sides or below against a black background. What did that do? It makes any internal features like inclusions or growth lines really pop. They stand out brightly against the dark. Fantastic for seeing what's inside. Wow. It really shows how just changing the lighting can reveal so much. Mm. It's a mix of science and just careful looking. That's a great way to put it. Okay. Moving into the modern age. Electronic and digital gem testers. This sounds like where tech gives us some shortcuts. It definitely can. These use electronic principles for quick checks, like um, thermal conductivity testers. Thermal conductivity. Heat. Yeah. They measure how quickly heat passes through the stone. Diamonds are amazing heat conductors, way better than most fakes. So it's a fast check for diamonds. A very fast check. If the needle jumps way up, it's likely diamond. Glass or CZ, not so much. It measures how fast the stone pulls heat away from the probe tip. Clever. Quick and easy. Mm -hmm. Any others? Electronic refractive index meters, too. 
They give a digital reading of the RI, often quicker and maybe more precise for some people than the traditional refractometer. Speed is a big plus here, especially in, say, a retail setting. Yeah, I can see that being useful for quick sorting. Okay, now for even more detail, the guide mentions microscopes and imaging equipment. Loops are great, but microscopes. Yeah, that's another level. Oh, absolutely. Gemological microscopes offer much higher magnification, sometimes up to 60x or more, and they often have specialized lighting built in dark field, bright field, overhead. So you can see really fine details. Exactly. Tiny inclusions, growth patterns, evidence of treatments like heating or filling, things you'd miss with a loop. It's critical for really accurate ID and grading. Makes sense. And imaging, like taking pictures. Yep. Photography setups are becoming really important for documenting stones, think insurance, appraisals, but also for study. Sometimes a good photo reveals details you missed looking directly. Right. A permanent record you can zoom into later. It's not just seeing, it's documenting and analyzing. Uh -huh. Okay, then there's software and digital tools. Tech creeping in everywhere. It really is. There's software now that can help analyze data from other instruments. You input readings and it helps narrow down possibilities, maybe even generates reports. Like a digital assistant gemologist. Sort of. And mobile apps too. Quick reference guides, databases. Some even use AI. You know, you take a picture and it gives you a potential ID to start with. Wow. The field's definitely evolving. It's like carrying a library in your pocket. It is changing fast. Now, what if you're not in a lab? The guide talks about portable and travel-friendly kits. Sounds great for enthusiasts on the go. Yeah, this is really practical for gem dealers, appraisers out in the field, or even hobbyists maybe going to gem shows or hunting. What goes in a basic field kit? Well, definitely a good 10x triplet loop. That's non-negotiable. Uh, tweezers, a portable light source, maybe a small LED torch, perhaps some basic hardness picks. The essentials. Exactly. And there are even compact versions of some other testers now, like portable refractometers or UV lights. It's about having key tools handy wherever you are. That sounds really appealing, actually, for traveling or gem fairs. Mm -hmm. Now, for people wanting to get more serious at home, the guide covers building a home gemology lab. Does it have to cost a fortune? Not to start, no. The guide suggests being budget-friendly initially. Focus on those fundamentals we talked about first. Loop, tweezers, cleaning stuff. Right. Maybe a basic hardness kit. Get really good with those. Then, as your interest and, frankly, your budget allows, you can add more. So grow into it. Exactly. Build your setup over time. The guide likely distinguishes between what's essential to start versus what's optional or more advanced. That makes it feel much less intimidating. And to help figure out what to buy when, there's a section on choosing the right tools for your skill level. Yeah. Super important, right? Don't want to buy gear you can't use yet. Precisely. For beginners, the real goal should be mastering that basic kit. Getting really comfortable and proficient with the loop, tweezers, proper handling, basic observation. Build the foundation first. Yes. Then, as you learn more, maybe add a dichroscope or a UV lamp, something that adds another layer of testing you understand. The guide probably gives pathways like beginner tools, then intermediate, then advanced. Tailored recommendations, yeah. that's helpful. Yeah. Okay, practical question. Where do you actually buy this stuff? The guide mentions reputable suppliers. Yeah, you need to find places that specialize in gemological equipment. Could be online stores, could be physical suppliers. Buying from known sources is key for quality. So you know the tools are accurate. Exactly, and that they'll last. The guide might also touch on buying new versus used. Used can save money, but you need to be careful. Check the condition, calibration if needed. Good points. Buyer beware, especially with used precision tools. And once you have them, it's not set and forget. Proper care and maintenance is in the guide too. Absolutely essential. Like any precision instrument, they need looking after. Regular cleaning is huge, not just gems, but the lenses on your loop, microscope, refractometer. Dust and smudges are the enemy again. Always. Proper storage too, keep them safe from damage, moisture. And for the more complex tools, calibration is vital. Making sure they're reading correctly, servicing them periodically. If you neglect that. You risk inaccurate results which could lead to misidentifying a gem, overpaying, underking, costly mistakes. A little maintenance saves a lot of headaches. Definitely sounds worth the effort. Now, even with perfect tools perfectly maintained, you still need to know what you're doing. The guide includes common mistakes to avoid. What trips people up? Well, a big one is just misreading the results. Especially with tricky instruments like the refractometer or spectroscope, it takes practice and knowledge to interpret what you're seeing correctly. So learning the theory is as important as having the cool. 
Absolutely. Another mistake is skipping that calibration maintenance we just talked about leads to unreliable data. Right. Complacency. Yeah. And also just using the wrong technique, holding the loop wrong, not having the right lighting for a specific test, little things that can throw off the results. Good reminders. Having the gear is step one. Using it right is step two. Okay, finally, the guide looks to the future of gemology tools. Mm. What's on the horizon? Sounds exciting. It is pretty dynamic. The guide probably mentions ongoing tech improvements. Yeah. Maybe more sensitive ways to analyze light absorption, even better portable tools. Smaller, faster, better. That's often the trend, yeah. And AI, artificial intelligence is a big one. AI assisting with identification, maybe analyzing complex data patterns faster than a human could. Automation, too. So potentially making gem analysis faster, more accurate, maybe even more accessible. That's the hope. It's a field that definitely doesn't stand still. It certainly sounds like it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as we wrap up this deep dive into the world of gemology tools, what's the big takeaway for listeners? I think the main thing is just how essential these tools are for really understanding and appreciating gems, whatever your level, from a simple loop to complex machines. Yeah. Each one helps reveal something unique. They unlock the characteristics, the stories, really, that are hidden inside every single stone. Absolutely. They're the keys, aren't they? Keys to unlock those hidden stories, letting us see beyond just the surface beauty into their um, intricate inner worlds. Well said. And it makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah. With this knowledge of the tools, what hidden stories and gems might you be curious to uncover now? Or maybe what part of gemology, seeing the tools involved, sparks your interest the most? Something to ponder. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive.